Good morning, and welcome to worship as the first United Church of Christ Congregational in Milford, Connecticut, where we honor all people and lift up community in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm Adam Eckhart, senior pastor. Today, in recognition of the big football game, we're doing a couple things that uh, might remind us a little bit of the football phenomenon. In a couple minutes, we'll be singing the national anthem. When's the last time we did that in here? Um, we have some wonderful music. It's not a halftime show per se, but, you know, it kind of is in the middle of the service. Um, and then, of course, after worship, we'll have wonderful post-game celebrations downstairs with Coffee Hour hosted by our deacons. So we're grateful for that as well. But nobody's going to be dumping any kind of Gatorade on anybody at the end of this, right? Okay. Okay. Um, great. Uh, <laughs> Today we have uh, Sunday School, which begins after the children's message. And after worship, we have a very uh, quick youth choir rehearsal from 11.10 a.m. to 11.30 for 4th through 7th graders who want to sing. And then we have a youth PF lunch at 11.30 a.m. At the same time, I will be up in the church library hosting an adult baptism meeting um, start, yeah, it's at 11.30. And that's for anybody who hasn't been baptized and is an adult might be interested in uh, learning about what that could mean. The horrific earthquake in Turkey and Syria has devastatingly killed over 25,000 people and has uh, impacted the lives of millions of people. Uh, First Church Milford has connections with the local Turch Turkish Cultural Center, uh, Wellspring Community Center, um, and uh, we also with the UCC, and we have some ways that you can help uh, make a difference as people recover from that uh, horrible tragedy. And I think some of you may have gotten a little flyer similar to this. And uh, you can see the donations are being accepted through uh, Wednesday, and that's 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. over at Research Drive in Milford. Uh, and any way that you can help, I'm sure, will make a difference in the life of somebody who is going through some really difficult times right now. There are many ministry and committee meetings coming up in the week ahead, uh, deacons and stewardship and trustees. Also know that on Wednesday mornings, we have women's fellowship from 10 a.m. Uh, to noon down in Fellowship Hall. Um, and now I invite up Ashley for an announcement. This is not a commercial about Doritos, Pepsi, or luxury cars. <laughs> this is about youth rocking to end homelessness. Um, our Rockathon is next weekend, and we are excited about inviting you to drop off cans and bottles during the Rockathon, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock out in the church parking lot. Um, or you are very, very, very welcome to sponsor uh, one of our youth or advisors who will be rocking um, starting from 11 a.m. on Saturday until 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary on Sunday. Um, you will find one of our youth in the narthex after worship, or um, uh, we are also going to be available in coffee hour um, if you're interested about sponsoring. So thank you. Thank you. A week from Tuesday, February 21st, First Church is hosting the Pancake Supper, one of the most delicious and fun dinners here of the year. And uh, will somebody be helping out with the bacon Anne, are you going to be helping with the bacon? Anne Sabo is going to be helping with the bacon. She loves helping with the bacon. But uh, it's a delicious uh, dinner. Um, you know, it's associated with Mardi Gras the day before uh, Lent begins when uh, traditionally uh, people would uh, rid their cupboards of fat and meat and things like that. Uh, so we do that before Lent. And then the day after, on Wednesday, February 22nd, we begin the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday services. We'll have a brief 10-minute service here from 7 to 7, 10 a.m. Uh, people can have the imposition of ashes then. I'll be here through 8 a.m. for any kind of drop-in uh, ash imposition. And then from 7 to 7.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary, we'll have a slightly longer service uh, with special music from the adult choir, uh, ashes, as well as the sacrament of Holy Communion. We uh, thank all of those who make our morning worship possible. We thank our adult choir, we thank our staff, we thank our special uh, musician here this morning, Will, and uh, we are just grateful to have you all here this morning. But now is the time when we get to, um, well, if you need it, you can open up your hymnal, but if you know the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner, you can just rise as we uh, sing uh, the Star Spangled Banner.
play ball, that's right, play ball. And now let us greet one another with signs of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. While you're still standing, if you're able, let us join our voices in the call to worship for the first half. Happy are those who walk in the way of the Lord. No matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. We Let us worship God, whose love through Jesus Christ wins our hearts. And let us pray together. God, life is filled with constant growth and change that you make possible through the laws of physics and the dynamics of biology. We grow and heal because you sustain us in every moment. Be present now as we grow in spirit and community. Give us the growth we need to be your children and disciples of Christ. We pray this in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, can I have all of our children and youth join me in the front so that we can hear our first scripture reading and then go into our children's message. Um, will one of you help leverage me up off the floor if I sit down? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sadie. Good morning. So our first scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And the subject header in it, if you look in the Bible, is on divisions in the Corinthian church. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as fleshly as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are fleshly. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not fleshly and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not all too human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each will receive wages according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers working together. You are God's field, God's building. Who's confused? You all understand that perfectly? Who's confused out there? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's be honest, right? That's a confusing scripture reading. Um, so this scripture is about divisions in the church that was being established in Corinth. So what does the word division mean? It's a type of math. And what do you do? No, no, that's, that's completely accurate. What do you do in that kind of math? Yes. 
you take away, right? You're separating. Yeah. Yeah, you're separating groups of numbers. Divisions are in like English terms, like in the terms of this scripture reading, disagreements. So if you think about, you know, like, have you heard the phrase, the country is divided? Yeah? They're not talking about math problems. They're talking about people not agreeing and not being on the same page. And, you know, disagreements can be big or they can be small. My favorite example of a disagreement that some people will say is big and other people will say is small is whether pineapple belongs on pizza. <laughs> that is my favorite example. Who here thinks that pineapple belongs on pizza? Oh, you've never tried it? Oh, I love it. And who here thinks that pineapple should never go near pizza? Yeah, exactly, right? That is a disagreement. But is that like a big disagreement or just like a little one? A little one, right? I'm glad we can all agree that like pineapple is not the biggest disagreement you will ever have in your life. Um, tonight, there's a big football game happening. Does anybody remember what that football game is called? The Super Bowl. And who remembers who's playing? Tyler? Chiefs and Eagles. This is an ongoing conversation Tyler and I have had um, in JPF. It, it's happening later today. Yeah. So you've still got time to make your guesses. Um, so let's think about the Super Bowl a little bit. Who do you think God wants to win? <laughs> Chiefs, why? Because, because that's who they are? Yeah? Okay, but, there's, but do you have a reason why you think God wants the Eagles to win or no? Okay, okay, so Eagle, the symbol of the U.S. Rihanna. Rihanna. <laughs> the halftime show. Um, so it's kind of a weird question to ask, right? Like when I asked you, you were like, there's like no right answer, right? Until the game. Like there's no right answer. Um, can you just do, do me a favor, just close your eyes. I want you to picture God however you picture God wearing a football jersey with face paint on and eating nachos. Weird, right? Weird. It's the scripture reading that we heard tells us not to be jealous and not to fight with each other. That we are human and that we should try to be better spiritual people. Right? Football doesn't matter. <gasps> Football doesn't matter. As I'm wearing green for the birds. Football doesn't matter. The last verse of our scripture reading says, For we are God's co-workers working together. So while we may disagree on things like which football team to cheer for and like my family's from Philly, so you all know where I stand. Um, I've confirmed that Adam is wearing green for ordinary time, not for the Eagles. Um, so we may disagree on what, to, what team to cheer for, on whether pineapple belongs on pizza, and bigger issues like politics. Um, but we are still part of God's creation and called to work together, right? You can't constantly fight everybody. That's just exhausting. Yes. Amazing. You just, you thumbs up agreeing? I'm so glad you agree. That's, that's the antithesis, the opposite of disagreeing, right? Agreeing. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. It doesn't matter who wins at the baseball game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and some people do think that, like, God is on their side when it comes to sports teams and games and things. But I just, I just want you to picture that again of God eating nachos and, 
and face fully painted. Um, so before we close with a prayer, um, who can think of a way that they work with someone else? How are you a coworker, like the scripture prompts? How do you work together? I'm looking at a pair of brothers over here. How do you work together? You don't? Do you work together to drive your parents crazy sometimes? Yeah. There were head nods there. Oh, that's such a good example. Um, you bring your best friend pickles and she brings you Cheetos. Like that is, that is coordination to the best level. Oh, and you'll have to work together to take care of the guinea pig. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got you. I follow. So you have to work together at home. How many of you have to work with somebody sometimes at school? Yeah? Group projects? Yeah, yeah. Nobody likes group projects. You like group projects? Oh, <gasps> Teach me your ways. Group projects would always get me down. How many of you have to work with somebody? Yeah, I'm looking out here. How many of you have to work with somebody and sometimes just go, man, this would go so much faster if I could do it by myself? Yeah, yeah. Why are we connected? Oh, that's an existential question. You are legit connected. Um, so these are all awesome ideas. And I hope that you all can see the links, the connections between divisions and working together like we're seeing in the scripture reading. Um, now for our last piece of working together, um, would you all do our repeat after me Sunday school prayer with me um, before we sit and get a chance to listen to the congregation sing our hymn? Would you all do the Sunday school prayer with me? Yeah, okay. So we got to stand up for that. I got it, I got it. I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Um, if you were able to please stand. And this is a repeat after me prayer. Repeat after me prayer. This is a repeat after me prayer. This is a repeat after me God above, God above and, below, and below and all around us, and all around us. May, your joy may your joy bubble up in me, up in me. May, your may your love be my actions, be my actions. and may your, peace may your peace extend throughout the world. Throughout the world. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going to sit down because we're going to listen to the hymn that we're going to sing. Um, if you want to grab a hymnal to sing it, you are welcome to. Yes, after, after the hymn, we're going to go to Sunday school. But, so we're going to listen.
join me in our prayer of dedication. On this day, many of us will eat from our abundant refrigerators and cupboards and will enjoy the warmth of homes. We dedicate these offerings and our ministries to help those of us without food or shelter and to remind us that regardless of our resources, nationality, or sports allegiances, you love us all unconditionally and call us to do so too. Bless our offerings and ministries for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our second reading for today comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 21 through 30. So the last uh, couple of weeks we've heard from the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes, and then uh, last week with Salt and Light. And uh, in the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus refers to some of the laws that uh, are foundational for uh, the Jewish people, and he responds to the ways in which those laws are important and foundational, and yet there's also more uh, that we can do to help ourselves in terms of relating to one another and relating to God. So listen now for God's word. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not kill, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering a gift at the altar... If you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a person with lust has already committed adultery with them in their heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. May God add rich blessings to this reading of Holy Word. And will you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Nobody in football should be called a genius, former professional quarterback Joe Theismann said. A genius is a guy like Norman Einstein. <laughs> Sports gives us some humorous quotations, and before I uh, follow that one up with a few other quotes, let me first be clear that as a minister who professionally speaks for long periods of time on Sunday mornings, I feel for athletes and politicians who say silly things because when you talk a lot in public, you end up being recorded saying silly things. Like former NBA executive Pat Williams, who said of his team at the time, the Orlando Magic, when it was just an expansion team, we can't win at home, we can't win on the road. As general manager, I just can't figure out where else to play. <laughs> or there's Formula One racing commentator Bob Varsha, who once said, the drivers have one foot on the brake, one on the clutch, 
and one on the throttle. (laughs) Or Terrell Owens, who once told reporters, don't say I don't get along with my teammates. I just don't get along with some of the guys on the team. (laughs) Now, sports figures often try to avoid putting their foot in their mouth like that by recycling some of the same phrases over and over, these trite phrases that many of us are familiar with. With the big football game being played today, for instance, I imagine that sometime someone's going to be interviewed and they're going to say that they or someone else gave 110% on the field, right? We just know that somebody will say that. But when you think about it, that is also a little Kind of silly, 110%. It's the sports equivalent of that scene in This Is Spinal Tap, where guitarist Nigel shows documentary director Marty how his amplifier's volume knobs go up to 11. It's one of these things where Nigel says, like, yeah, it's up at 10, and then I have the big solo, and then I can turn it up to 11. But then Marty asks Nigel why they don't just make the 10 setting a little bit louder and not worry about 11. Nigel pauses in disbelief and obliviousness, and he says, well, this goes up to 11. But if 10 is usually the loudest, what does 11 really mean? You're just making up numbers. Isn't also with sports just saying that somebody can play 110%, just lowering our standards for what 100% is? Now, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus points out a similar dynamic with some of the laws out there, and specifically two of the Ten Commandments that we heard about in today's reading. Jesus points out how there is more that we can do than simply fulfilling those particular laws. First, Jesus says, You've heard it said that you shall not kill, but I say don't even let anger get the best of you. Not only that, but try to resolve your disagreements as soon as you possibly can. Jesus proclaims that while it's helpful to start with not killing as a guide, that really shouldn't be the only bar we're trying to clear. It's like when somebody says, at least they didn't kill somebody. Nobody ever says, oh, Sally tutors underprivileged kids twice a week but at least she didn't kill somebody. No, it's when somebody does something bad that that comes out, right? It's when somebody accidentally burns down their neighbor's garage, or when they have the winning lottery ticket, but they lose it, or when it's found out that somebody's engaged simultaneously to three different people. That's when the at least they didn't kill somebody card gets brought out, right? You know, something regrettable has happened when somebody says, at least they didn't kill somebody. In our world, there is a lot of disrespect and violence out there that does not kill somebody, but still goes against God's will. And we can see anger can distort our perceptions. Anger can cause us to see people as less than fully human, as a precursor to violence. Just watch the news and you'll hear about incidents of road rage. Remember what happened to Tyree Nichols when the police beat him and he he died. These are cases where anger does lead to violence. But in smaller ways, anger builds up walls between people, causing rifts in families and communities because people were not willing to forgive or to make up or see eye to eye. God created us all and wants us to find common ground and love, so we have to pay attention to whether our anger leads us down constructive or destructive paths. Just by saying that we didn't kill somebody doesn't mean that we gave 100% that day. Following Jesus takes us a lot further than that. Then Jesus talks about the seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. There's a whole conversation to be had about historical understandings of adultery as it relates to gender. So for now, let's just define adultery as cheating on a partner. 
And let's agree that there's a whole range of behaviors between being completely faithful to a partner and cheating on them. There's flirting. There's over-investing in an emotional connection with someone besides your partner. There's neglecting some of the dimensions of a relationship. Those are all ways that people can be less than fully faithful to a partner. But Jesus, Jesus is smart because he goes straight to the lecherous glance as his example of something in between. We know that look. One of the most tried and true memes out there, if you know what memes are, is the man looking at other woman meme. There's a woman and her partner, but he's looking over his shoulder at the woman who just walked by. And they use this meme in all sorts of ways, and they do so because it is a fairly common occurrence. We've seen other folks do that. We may have ourselves done that, given a little bit of a double take when somebody attractive's walked by. Or maybe if we haven't done that to a real person, maybe it's because we saw some pretty person on a screen. We know it's a bad idea. We want to focus all of our attention and our desire on the person we're committed to. But then we see that Channing Tatum is in one more Magic Mike movie. Or Rihanna will probably be dancing around scantily clad at halftime, singing with her sultry voice. Valentine's Day is on Tuesday, and on that day we probably shouldn't say, will you be more like Salma Hayek or Bradley Cooper? But in our minds, we might be thinking that. Jesus' words are actually why in 1976, Jimmy Carter was interviewed as a presidential candidate. And in that interview, he admitted, admitted kind of out of the blue that he had committed adultery in his heart, meaning that he had had impure thoughts about other women. Man, I miss the 1970s when that caused a stir, right? <laughs> Feels like ancient history now. Now, Carter could speak that way because he was immersed in the language of the Sermon on the Mount, when it's understood that there are so many things that we can do besides actual adultery that can be less than pure. In today's reading and throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is leading us towards this Jewish ethic of love as the ultimate law. Now this time of year we might hear the word love and think of gushy feelings towards our beloved. And that's not wrong. That's certainly one definition of love. But in the Gospels, Jesus uses the word, usually the Greek word agape, to mean persistent actions that honor the full humanity of all God's children and the deep value of all God's creation. In our romantic relationships, that means having that gushy feeling, but it can also mean loving our beloved as a whole person and not just for the parts of them that we like best. It means staying faithful to them. And it means when we see an attractive person walking down the street, love means seeing them for the depth of their full personality and agency and integrity, and not just as an attractive body. And when we don't get along with our teammates in life, members of our family or our community, love means remembering that our differences don't nullify the divine spark that each of us holds within us. Love means working towards healing that relationship and maintaining those relationships. When we watch the Super Bowl this evening, if you do watch it, if you see the tight ends out on the field and on the sidelines, the commercials for beer, the betting apps, you see all the commercials with the pretty people in them. That can be a moment when you ask yourself, are we honoring God's command to love one another? I especially get concerned because I know that today can be a dangerous day, especially for those whose loved ones will get caught up in the aggression of the competition, who will drink alcohol, who will bet on the game. Factors like that can spark anger and domestic violence similar to the levels around other holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas. God knows that anger and desire can be destructive to people whom they're aimed at. But the good news is that God offers us a better game plan. 
We don't have to be a genius like Norman or Albert Einstein to follow Jesus. We just have to be willing to love God with 100% of our hearts, 100% of our souls, 100% of our minds, 100% of our strengths. And to love our neighbors 100%, just as we love ourselves. We just have to see the wholeness of life and creation as one fabric of God's love for all of us. A love that we can reflect back 100%. And in fact, the church is like a field where we practice teamwork in that 100% love. Where we seek to fulfill God's commandment to love. Where we follow in the footsteps of Jesus who really did leave it all on the field, dying for our sake. God calls us not just to refrain from destructive actions, but to just to strive for beloved community based on the teachings and actions of Jesus. And God calls us to call others into the orbit of that divine love. As we break from this huddle, as God sends us out into the world, remember that we all have a role to play in showcasing God's love on earth as it is in heaven. Thanks be to God, and amen. And now we get to sing the English verses of the hymn Fumamina. God, you fill us with your Holy Spirit. You share this time with us. Here and now we are bound by a common love for this world and your people. I'll be mourning the death of so many in Turkey and Syria. We remain concerned about where the Russian invasion of Ukraine is headed. We face personal uncertainties and doubt. And yet in the midst of all of this, you are our rock and our shield our shelter from the stormy blast. And this place which our ancestors and faith built to worship you, this place shelters us and gives us a place to be centered on you. That you know, not only comfort us, but also challenge us to finer living. We admit that we have failed in what we have done and thought and what we have failed to think through. We've let animosities divide us in our community turn us into factions, forgive us and reveal the joy of reconciliation. God be with our friends in this area who are from Turkey, those who grieve the death of family and friends, those who are seeking to help. May we, as your people, reach out with mercy and care. We pray for Faith Formation Minister Kelsey as she prepares for the birth of a second child, Bless her and husband Joe and big Sib James. Will God help couples honor their love for one another as a reflection of your love? May we honor the gift of love in all of our connections, romantic and otherwise. Be with those who are celebrating anniversaries this month, like Janice and Earl. 
Health, O God, is a fragile gift, one that grows more tenuous over time, and yet you surround your hurting children with care. And so we name some people now who hurt in body or in spirit. Joe, Dave, Peter, Susan, Don, Scott, Dana, Linda, Cindy, If it is your will, grant them your healing spirit. And we pray for those who mourn the death of loved ones. We pray for the family and friends of Russ Gamwell. We pray for the family and friends of Diana Davison, who the flowers are given in memory of this week. God, offer those who mourn the hope of life eternal and your eternal love. Every day and every moment, God, we praise you for you are the source of all being, the hope we yearn for, abounding in steadfast love and overflowing grace. And so we pray this all through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit reveal the humanity of all the people and lead us to live in righteousness and mercy. Amen.